Let us turn our attention to the word of God. Um, even though we are only few, let me tell you, if you can give yourself into the hand of the Holy Spirit, He can change you. As when Paul was preaching near a river and there was one lady, her name was Lydia, and her heart was on fire when, she, when Paul was preaching to them. Let me tell you one thing, if you can give your complete attention to the Lord, and let the Holy Spirit capture your heart. And let your heart be on flame to receive from the Lord. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So today I want to present to you the word that God has given me in my heart. It is about the passion for God. Hallelujah. Passion for God. Praise the Lord. Passion is a very creative force that makes impossible possible. Hallelujah. When we look around the many achievements that is happening in the music, in the movie, in the art and the science, everything are part of the result of some people's passion. Hallelujah. And passion is a strong emotion that God has given to take some bold action. Passion is what causes explorers to bold to go where no man has gone before. Passion is what caused scientists to spend late night hours trying to find a cure for a dreadful disease. Passion is what that take good athletes and turn him, him or her into a great athlete when they are breaking records. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Do you know this person? <laughs> As uh, the FIFA is going on right now, I thought I will talk about him. He is called Leonard Messi. And I read about him actually. You know, at the age of five, his dad threw him into the ground and asked him to play soccer. And when his dad saw him playing, he played well. And later what happened at the age of seven, he got a pain in his leg. And his dad took him to the doctor. And the doctor said, he's having issue in his leg. The blood is not flowing rightfully. And you know what? And the doctor said, for the rest of his life, he cannot play. But he had a burning passion in his heart. He got in love with football. And you know, later the history, he is world's number one player. You know what that lead him? He did with the passion he had. He did which was impossible for him. He made it possible. Hallelujah. So let me tell you one thing today. As we read in Psalms 42, 1 and 2. As a deer pants for a water brook, so pants my soul for you, O oh God. Do you have that pan as a deer had looking for a brook? In John 17, 3 says, it is a prayer of Jesus. And Jesus is saying, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ. Knowing God, to know Him. In Matthew 5, 6, that we read here, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Hallelujah. Do we have that hunger and thirst? Let me ask you one thing. Today we came to the church. Is it because that it is just Sunday? We came to the church. Is it because we are Christians? We came to the church. This is it because we have a Christian name. We came to the church because we are leading the worship. Did we come to the church because he's a pastor? No, we come to the church because we have a passion for God. Amen. Hallelujah. Let that be the leading thing. If you just come like that, it is just a religion. People do religious activities. No, Christianity is not a religion. It is a passion for our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Let me tell you why we go to church. One Sunday morning, a mother went to wake up his son and tell him it was time to get ready for the church. To which he replied, I'm not going. And the mother asked, why not? She asked. I will give you two reasons. He said, they don't like me, and I don't like them. And the mother replied, I will give you two reasons why you should go to church. You are 59 years old, 
and you are the pastor of the church. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Let me ask you, let us go to the couple of questions. Why we need to have a passion for God? Why we need to have a passion for God? It is because, let me tell you my friends, because God is so passionate for you and me. There is no one in this world is as passionate as God for you. Come on my brothers. He is so passionate. Can you imagine how passionate God is? Hallelujah. Thank you Lord. In Jeremiah 31, 3 it says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with an unfailing kindness. You know what it is? God is saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Praise the Lord. What is the meaning of everlasting? When I look for the meaning of everlasting, the meaning is everlasting. We cannot say. It is beyond the comprehension, comprehension of human capacity. God is saying, I love you with an everlasting love. Thank you, Jesus. When we go back to Genesis, Genesis chapter 1, each and every time, think about it, when we are having a kid, you know, when we had our triplets long time back in 2010, I remember when we came to know that uh, my Shali is carrying, you know what I did, immediately I started preparing. I got so excited. I started looking into baby's clothes. I started looking into strollers. I started looking everywhere because I want to welcome my babies. Praise the Lord. I even went, by, I went and sold my car and what a van. Hallelujah. Let me tell you, God, when he thought of creating you and me, in the book of Ephesians, we read, according to his pleasure and will, he created us. And before God created, each one of us created the first human beings. God created everything they wanted. And God saw that. It is good. It is good. And let me tell you, my friends, that is the everlasting love of God. He, did, he made everything for us. Elimination 3.22, because of God's great love, we are not consumed. For His compassion never fails. When we go to Genesis, you know, let me tell you each and every time when I prepare a message, I cannot avoid Genesis and I cannot avoid the cross of Christ. Because Genesis is the root cause of everything. We will understand everything from Genesis and the solution is on the cross. When we read the book of Genesis chapter 1, each and every time when God created, God created grass, God created animals, God created birds, everything God created. And God said, when I create, God created everything on its own kind. Hallelujah. When we read chapter 1 verse 11, then God said, let the earth bring forth the grass, the herd that yields seeds, and the fruit trees that yield fruit according to its kind. Hallelujah. When you read again, it says, God created the trees according to its kind. And verse 21, God created great, great sea creatures and everything that moves in which the waters abound according to its kind. And let me tell you, when you read verse 26, here very clearly, and God is saying, then God said, let us make man for our image and our likeness. Hallelujah. When God created everything on its own kind, God created you and me in his kind. Hallelujah. That is the everlasting love that God has given us. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. What did God give to demonstrate is his love? What did God give? He gave everything. God gave everything to us to demonstrate his passion for you and me. 
Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Number two, why we need to have passion for God? Because we are betrothed to Jesus. Hallelujah. We are in, in 1st, 2nd Corinthians 11, 2 says, I have betrothed you to one husband. That is why we need to have a passion. Church, we are the bride of Jesus. In Revelation 19, 7 to 8 says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come. And his wife has made herself ready. The church is the wife of Jesus. That is why God and Jesus is expecting undivided passion for him. Do we have our passion for God? Do we realize that we are betrothed to Jesus? And our bridegroom Jesus is looking to his bride, you and me. He is looking us. He has, he came to this earth and gave everything on the cross. And now in his glorious body, the one who has his eyes like flaming fire, whose voice is like a sound of many waters. He had his right hand, the seven stars, and out of his mouth went the sharp two-edged sword. Who is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And Jesus, he is looking at the church. And he's telling in Revelation chapter 2, he's telling that I found you, that you have left your first love. Our bridegroom, every moment of our life, he's looking at us. What he is going to tell about you and me is Jesus is going to say, Yes, I know your works, I know your labor. I know your patience that you cannot bear those who want to evil and you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not. Yes, you have done so many things. God knows all what we are doing. But one thing, Jesus is looking at the church and telling one thing, church. Yes, you are doing everything for me. But let me tell you, where is me in you? Hallelujah. Jesus always wants that first love to him. That passion. He's looking for that. More than we do anything for Jesus. One thing that Jesus is always expecting. Are we with him? Are you spending your time with him? The church of Ephesians has done so many things. They're doing great. But Jesus with his flaming eyes, he found one thing. You lost your first love. Remember the days, maybe 20 years, 15 years, 10 years, 30 years, 40 years, before you accepted the Lord. How it was then, how it is now. Is your passion has grown hotter and hotter, or it's grown old? Jesus is looking to you and me. Let him not tell that you are growing old. No, you need to tell. Yes, my daughter, my son, his love is growing and growing for me. His passion is growing and growing for me. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Let me tell you one thing. Satan's greatest deception is to take that passion and devotion that we have for Jesus away from us. Hallelujah. In 2 Corinthians 11, 3, it says, But I am afraid that as Eve was deceived by serpent's cunning, your mind may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Hallelujah. Is our devotion and passion has gone away from Christ. When you look back to Garden of Eden, when Satan came and Satan is asking evil, if that 
Because did God ask you to eat the fruit? In Genesis 3, 4 it says, Then serpent said to woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that the day you eat of your eyes, of it your eyes will be open and you will be like God knowing good and evil Satan is putting that seed of doubt in the heart of Eve saying that God has restricted things from you that is the one thing which Satan will always try to murmur in your heart yes God doesn't love you he restricts you he restricts you he don't allow you to enjoy life that is the same thing that Satan is trying to put in the mind of Eve. Everything, there are so many trees, there are so many blessings for Eve. But one thing that Satan is saying, why God has restricted you? Because you will become like God. God, oh, Satan always wanted to put that doubt in the people's mind. Let me tell you one thing, my friends. Each and every moment there, are, there is one sacrament, the Holy Communion. Every time when we come together, we take it, right? Hallelujah. This is the one thing that God said, you need to do it until I come back. You know why God wants to do that? Each and every time when you have your bread in your hand and when you have your wine in your hand, one thing it is saying to you, Yes, my daughter, my son, remember me. Remember me. I have given everything to you. Don't let Satan do murmur in your heart and say that God has restricted things to you. No. When you look under the cross, you can see his open hands. You can see his blood flowing to the last drop and water started coming. And each and every time when you approach the holy table, this is what it is telling to you. My daughter, my son, I have given everything to you. Amen. When you get tired in your life, when you think that, oh, what is happening to me? When you think that, why this is happening to me? When you think that, why I am going through this trouble? When you think that, oh, has God loved me? When you think that I am alone in my life, remember one thing. Remember the cross. That is why the Holy Communion God has given you. Each and every time when you come together, remember that my Jesus, my bridegroom, he is so passionate for me and he has given everything for me to be saved. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Yes, we are living in this world. There are troubles in this world. There are sickness in this world. But let me tell you one thing. It is all going to end very soon. And he is and so passionate for you. Hallelujah. Let me go to the next one. Why we need to be passionate for God? Because it is eternal. It is eternal. Every passion that we have is temporal. It is going to end one day. But the passion that we have for God is going to be eternity. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. In 1 John 2 17, it says, The world and his desires will pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. All the desires of this world, everything that what you see with your naked eye, it is going to pass away. But there is only one thing. The passion that you have the, for the Lord that is going to take you to eternity. Hallelujah. That is why Solomon, the wisest man on the face of this earth, he enjoyed everything that what he can in his life. And he's saying in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, 6 to 8, he's saying, Remember you are creator. Before the silver cord is loosened, or the golden bowl is broken, or the pitcher shattered at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the wheel, then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. And he's saying, vanity of vanity, says the preacher, all is vanity. Remember the 
creator, the one who had enjoyed everything that he can on this face of the earth. He is the one, he is saying, end of his life, everything is going to go away. Your silver is going to be loosened. Your gold is going to be broken. But only one thing that is going to stay is your love to the Lord. Hallelujah. When you come to Psalm 73, where you can see Esau. Hallelujah. He went through a very tough time in his life. And he is saying in Psalm 73 verse 3, when I saw the prosperity of the wicked, they are not in trouble as other men, nor are they plugged into other men. Their eyes were bulged with the abundance. They have more than heart could fish. As of is looking to the world, as of is looking to the people who are wicked, and he sees so much prosperity, and he sees so much abundance for him, and he thought, God, I served you. I kept my heart pure before you. I did everything for you. Is it all in vain? What all I did? I did my devotion to you. I had my passion for you. Esau got confused. He got so confused. He said the world is growing. They are rich and they are getting more things, more blessing. What is happening to me? Um, I did all in vain. And then one thing he did. Hallelujah. In verse 17 it says, Until I went into the sanctuary of God. Hallelujah. We need to go to the sanctuary of God. Then you will see. Then I understand their end. Surely you set them in slippery place. You cast them down into destruction. All people who doesn't have Jesus in their life, they may have everything in their life, but let me tell you, if they don't have Jesus, they are standing on a slippery place. They are on their way to destruction. If you are confused, go to the presence of God. If you are tired, go to the presence of God and He will reveal you the glory that God has given to you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And then in verse 25, He's saying, He got the answer for that. And in verse 25, He's saying, Hallelujah. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is none upon earth. If you should have that vision in your life. For getting that understanding. Go to the presence of God. Hallelujah. Let me tell you. You may be going through troubles in your life. You may be looking. Why am I going through this? Why this trouble in my life? Why all my friends who doesn't serve the Lord. They are getting everything. They are happy. They are enjoying their life. But let me tell you, when you go to the throne of God, when you go to the presence of God, you will know. And then Esau said, Lord, I understood. I know it now. I kept my heart pure. It is not in vain. I am sorry, Lord. And I wanted to proclaim one thing before the Lord. Whom oh, how I am. Can you tell yourself, putting your hand in your chest and say, Jesus, Jesus, I don't want anything. Whatever may happen around me, I don't care. I care only one thing. You are my mission. You are my God. I want you only. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. That is why in Jeremiah 9.23 it says, This is what the Lord says. Let not the wise boast on their wisdom, or the strong boast on their strength, or the rich boast on their riches. But let the one who boasts, boast about this, that they have the understanding to know me. The prophet of God is crying out, don't boast in your wisdom, don't boast in your riches, don't boast on anything that you have on this earth. No, it is all temporal, it is going to go away. Boast, if you want to boast, boast in one thing, that you know God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. As a child of God, as a Pentecostal,
so believers, let me tell you, we started with a passion for God. In 1900s, there were a few people in Los Angeles. Few people came together and they started worshiping God with a passion. They started serving God with a passion. And when they had passion, God came in, in their midst. Hallelujah. And God started this Pentecostal movement. And let me tell you one thing. Pentecostal movement is based on the passion for Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Praise Jesus. In Luke 12, 16 to 21, it says, there Jesus is talking about a rich man. And he got a good yield on that ear. And he came to his home and he said, Oh, I don't have space in my home. Let me bring down my room and let me extend the home. Let me make another room and let me fill my room with all the yield that I got this year. And let me enjoy. Let me be merry. God is looking at him. You know what God called him? God is calling him. Hallelujah. In verse 20, but God said to him, Fool. This night your soul will be required of you what you are going to do with all the riches that you got. Hallelujah. Lord should not look to each one of us and tell them, no. Let our passion be on the eternal Lord our Savior, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Praise to Jesus. People with passion. I want to introduce some of the people. Abraham became the father of believers because of his passion for God. When you read Genesis chapter 22, where God came to Abraham, God wanted to test him. Does he have the same passion to me even after getting a child on his old age? God came to test Abraham and he called Abraham, Abraham, sacrifice your son. And you know the story. And let me tell you one thing very important. In verse 12 it says. When Abraham proved himself to God. Yes my devotion and my passion is for you and you alone. And Abraham took his knife to give sacrifice to the Lord. You know what? Angel has to call Abraham two times. When angel gave the command he called only once. He said Abraham. You sacrifice your son. But Abraham, take your knife. Because of his passion, even the angel got scared. He said, Abraham, Abraham, stop, stop, stop. The angel called him two times. He stopped him. Abraham proved with his wife that my devotion and my passion is to my God. Nothing is going to come between me and God. Hallelujah. And God blessed Abraham. God blessed Abraham. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> Joshua became the successor of Moses because of his passion for God. Joshua, son of God, let me ask you, you are not related to Moses. You don't have anything to do with it. But why you became the successor of Moses? Why you became the leader of Israelites? Joshua can tell you, tell us one thing. I have my passion for God. When you read in Exodus chapter 33, verse 10 to 11, all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the tabernacle door. And all the people rose and worshipped each man in his tent door. Hear, hear this very carefully. So the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. And he returned to his camp. Picture this with me. The, the, the people of Israel, yes, they were all waiting and they are seeing, they are all standing on the door of their tent and they are seeing the cloud coming down in the tabernacle and God is, the God's presence is there. And God is speaking to Moses face to face. And all the people started worshipping in the God in their door of their tent. Nobody came to the tabernacle. And Moses spoke with God face to face. And Moses also left. And the next verse it says, 
but his servant Joshua, son of Nun, a young man, did not depart from the tabernacle. He didn't have to be staying there. He's a young man. Hallelujah. He can do many other things. He can enjoy his life. But let me tell you, when all the people, maybe six million or whatever, when they are all comfortable in their tents, yes, they have seen the glory of God. They have worshipped the Lord. But what made Joshua unique from the whole Israelite? He stayed. Because he knew one thing. If I can enjoy the presence of God. If I need to know my Lord a little bit more. He took an extra step. He took that uncomfortable place. He said he did not depart from the tabernacle. Every other people will be enjoying in their tent. Sleeping. But this young man decided to stay back. This gave a revelation to him the power of the Almighty. And God revealed himself to him. And that is why when you read, when they went to spy the Canaan, when all the people, all the people who were selected, they said, we cannot go there. They are stronger than us. They are bigger than us. We are like grasshoppers in front of them. But only two people, Joshua and Caleb, you know what they did? They tore their dress. They tore their clothes. You know why? Joshua and Caleb knew the power of God. They have enjoyed the presence of God. They have seen how great is our God. How mighty is our God. They know one thing. We won the victory. We defeated the Amorites. We defeated the Philistines. Not because of our power. Not because of our skill. But because of the presence of God. They knew that. They, they were convinced about that. Man's power is not going to help us. But they knew one thing. The one who is in us is greater than this Canaanite giants. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise you Jesus. And they tore their clothes and they said, in Numbers 14, verse 8, it says, If the Lord delights in, in us, then he will bring us into this land and give this to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. That is the conviction Joshua had. Why? He did not depart the tabernacle and he stayed in the presence of God. That gave him the boldness to tell that, no, if God has given a promise to us, he is able to give that. Can you believe that in your personal life? If God has given a promise to you, you may be seeing the problems. The problems will be standing as a giant in front of you. Don't look at the giant. Look at the God who gave you the promise. And tell that. Tell that. God. You have given the promise and you are able to take us into the promised land that you have given to us. And you know what happened? Only two people who left the Egypt reached Canaan. Only two people. It is very serious. They have all seen the miracle of God. They have all seen the mighty power of God that God has demonstrated in Egypt in front of Pharaoh. They have eaten the heavenly food. Oh, hallelujah. They have seen everything, but they did not reach because of their doubt. They did not try to know God more. They were satisfied with what they had. They were concentrated on their blessings more than the one who gave the blessings. They missed to know the God. Hallelujah. Let that not happen to us. We are all in a journey. We are all in a journey to reach our eternal home. Let not this happen to any one of us. That is the whole purpose of church. 
Church has two purposes. One is to bring people who doesn't believe in God to church. And the number two purpose is to take who all we are here to heaven. There are twofold. One is to bring the non-believers inside. And the number two, all believers to heaven. This is not our destiny. Heaven is our destiny. And all that what we do, the worship, the message, everything that what we do is to equip each one of us, you and me, to reach there for the marriage. Hallelujah. Be ready for that. Thank you, Jesus. I don't want to take much time. Hallelujah. Hannah gave her only son Samuel to God because of her passion to God. Stephen became the first matriarch because of his passion to God. Let me tell you one thing. Hallelujah. When Stephen became the matriarch of God. Hallelujah. When he was being stoned. He looked up to heaven and he saw heaven open and he saw Jesus not sitting. He saw Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Let me tell you, if you and me, we have a passion for God, our Jesus cannot sit on his seat. He will stand. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. He will stand for you. He will be so passionate. You know that when we happen, when you see soccer, when you see any game, when the things are happening, when it is on the climax, can you ever to sit on the seat? You will start jumping. You, will, you are so excited. In the same way, when you are passionate for Jesus on this earth, being humiliated, being stoned, only for one reason, I love Jesus more than anything. Jesus cannot sit on his seat. He will stand for you. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Peter got, got killed upside down because of his passion for Jesus. Paul was able to end with all ridicule, all stoning, everything because and Paul was able to say nothing can separate me from the love of God because of his passion for Jesus. John was, uh, John was exiled to uh, Patmos because of his passion for Jesus. Do we have passion for Jesus? Hallelujah. We need to stir up our mind. We need to reignite a passion for Jesus. Hallelujah. Restore our passion and love for our Lord. How we can have that? It is only by the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. That will make the difference. Hear that? That only will make the difference. When Peter was with Jesus, Peter has seen all the miracles of Jesus with his naked eyes. Literally he has seen. But on that day, on that eve, when Jesus was taken to the court, before that young servant girl, Peter denied Jesus. Hallelujah. And when, oh Jesus, and when he got the anointing of the Holy Spirit, after they received the power of the Holy Spirit, then they started standing in front of the people in Acts 4, 17 to 20. It says, and Peter is saying, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than God, church. He got the power, he got the passion, he got the love and devotion for the Lord after he received the anointing from above. After he had the upper room experience before he has been with Jesus. Think about it. He has seen literally everything with Jesus but still he denied Jesus. But after he received the power from above he became powerful. He got passionate. And even before the, in the priest and everybody, he said, No, we will preach Jesus. That made the difference. Hallelujah. Let me tell you, passion for Jesus. If you have passion for Jesus, that will lead you to compassion for the fellow beings. Hallelujah. The passion, the result of this passion, every passion has an action. I told you, the action of a believer's action of a child of God is to extend your hand of compassion to your fellow beings. Hallelujah. In Jude 1, 20 to 22, it says, But you, beloved, building yourself up in your most holy faith. Hallelujah. Verse 22. And all some have compassion, make a distinction, but others save. Others say with fear, 
pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. Hallelujah. This is what Jude is telling. Have compassion. Pull somebody out from the fire. We cannot simply sit and say, I have passion. I have passion for Jesus. No. There is an action that should follow your passion. That is the compassion that you have your fellow beings. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And let me tell you, let me encourage you. That is the one thing which we wanted to do it. If we do anything for the Lord, do with a compassion for others. Hallelujah. And one more thing I want to tell you, Deuteronomy 6, 7, 9, we say, we need to pass on this passion to our next generation. Isn't it? Amen. Isn't it? Do we need to pass on our passion? How we can pass on our passion? By having passion. You be passionate for the Lord at home. In prayer, in reading the Bible, in worshiping the Lord in prayer, in spiritual matters, in going to church, be passionate. And from the young age, you are giving that message to your children. Yes, my dad and my mom, they are passionate for Jesus. They are blessed because they are passionate for Jesus. They are enjoying, we are enjoying what we are having because of their passion for Jesus. Let them see that. Pray over your children and let them know that we receive and whatever blessings they are receiving, it is received only because we are serving the Lord. Hallelujah. We need to pass. Hallelujah. Our passion for our next generation. If you are not passing, we are failed. Hallelujah. Let me end up in here. William Booth. You know him. He is the father of Salvation Army. On his deathbed, he gave his final message, written in a paper, cover in a neck cover, gave to his uh, subordinate and he told him, you go and preach. Yes, he thought it will be a great message. And he came to the stage and opened the letter. And he saw only three words. You know what it is? Others, others, others. That was the heart of the great man. My passion is the compassion for my friend beings. So let me tell you one thing. Hallelujah. As we sang, consuming fire fall on us have a passion for us so whatever we do let us do with a passion for Jesus when we sing let us sing with a passion for Jesus when we worship let us worship with a passion for Jesus let us if we preach let us preach with a passion for Jesus each and everything that what we do let it be with a passion Allah for Jesus hallelujah let me end here. Let's close our eyes. Hallelujah. Father, we come to you, Lord. Help us. Help us to be passionate for you. In everything that we do, Lord, we give ourselves into thy hands. Fill us with your power. Reignite a passion.